Howdy folks. Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. I am back from my sojourn, from my sabbatical, from my trip to the wilderness, and back with a video on Atlantis, the Lost Continent. Now this legend of a glorious lost civilization that was utterly destroyed by a natural disaster was with us for over 2,000 years. It's a tale that's inspired broad speculation and given rise to fiction for many centuries. According to Otto Muck, who wrote a book called The Secret of Atlantis, 1978, it has inspired over 20,000 books. And I believe it. The original story comes from a couple works by Plato, the Greek philosopher, not Mickey Mouse's dog. And he actually wrote a lot of stuff, but this is some of his most famous works, you know, besides the Republic. And he actually has these guys talking about the ideal society, and that's where it comes up, the story of Atlantis as kind of a cautionary tale. And that, you know, got a lot of people to speculate. Was Atlantis real, or did Plato just make it up? The first one is called Timius. Now, I assume these guys, Timius and Critias, are just kind of friends of, of Socrates. They're well off enough that they can have time to sit around discussing life and philosophy. You know, they don't have to toil from sunset to to sunrise or whatever. And so Timmy's part, he's mostly talking about the nature of reality, the creation of the universe, the transmigration of souls and other weighty topics. Now there's a short bit where his friend Critias butts in and says, yeah, I know an ideal society. It was an ideal society. It was called Atlantis and it was destroyed. Now, I heard about this from the philosopher Solon. Well, actually, Solon had lived a couple hundred years before, but the philosopher Solon went to Egypt, and the Egyptians told him about it. So it was due to the arrogance of their people, and this all happened like 9,000 years before now. So to us, over 11,000. In the next dialogue, which is named after Critias, it's his turn to speak, and he tells a lot more about Atlantis. Now, he talks about the founding, the god Poseidon and his mortal wife, Plato. They had all these children, and they became the first Atlanteans. And uh, they were very virtuous, these Atlanteans, and they invented all this stuff, and they had all this great society. And he kind of describes the way it was laid out, you know, where there's a mountain, and there's all these concentric circles of water, and... And it sounds like a very beautiful place, but they became corrupt and uh, sinful, whatever. And finally, Zeus had enough, and Zeus said, I'm going to destroy you guys. But just when it's getting exciting, we've lost it. We've lost the rest of the dialogue. You know, the rest of Zeus's condemnatory speech and what he actually does, you know, we believe, you know, it was like an earthquake. That's what Plato meant. But unfortunately, that's lost. Now, I've read these two dialogues. They're not the easiest going because there's all this philosophy and I really only wanted to read about Atlantis. But, you know, maybe sometime I'll go back and read Plato's stuff for the philosophical input and not that. So really, Atlantis was a relatively small part of these two dialogues. So that's probably why a lot of scholars say, nah, it's a metaphor. He just made it up totally out of his mind. and the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he said, yeah, that's what it was. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor, it's an allegory, that's all. However, there were other of his Greeks from that same time that said, no, I think it's based on fact. I think he was inspired by a real situation. Crantor was one of them, and he was born about the same time that Plato wrote these two works, and he believed it was based on historical fact. And mostly, though, Crantor was not a historian. He mostly wrote about ethics. So these Greeks, they were like jacks of all trades, basically. Now, so besides these two theories about Atlantis, they're kind of split off into all these sub-theories. And I'll talk about some of them because it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And i got to give a shout-out to Mrs. Desperado, who helped me with some of this research. Now, the first theory, of course, is that it's purely an allegory. And 
That's kind of the boring one. <laughs> but among that theory, there's the idea that Plato didn't exactly make it up entirely, that he was inspired in his allegory. And you may have noticed that the Atlantis story is reminiscent of the biblical story of Noah and the flood, and also Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed by fire. You know, God is angry. <laughs> you people are so sinful, you know, and uh, we have got to cleanse the earth. So this was a theme that went on and on in, in mythology. You know, the Hebrews got it from other people. They got it from Sumerians. They got it from the Akkadians. It's in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So it's it's hardly original to the Bible, which, you know, makes it kind of hard for me to take that stuff seriously and, you know, as holy writ. <laughs> uh, so no doubt Plato had heard about this stuff. So, however, as time went by, you know, people just can't resist speculating. So uh, in the 1500s, you know, that we had the Renaissance and so on and, and a rebirth of scholarship, uh, the Greeks and the Romans, all that good stuff. and the philosopher, and also he was a public servant, <laughs> Francis Bacon, he was interested in it. And he said, you know what, Atlantis must have meant America, because we discovered it, it was out in the Atlantic, and that's what he was referring to. And he even wrote a utopian treatise called The New Atlantis, which he kind of lays out his, his um, philosophy for a ideal society which doesn't have that much to do. I suppose it was probably inspired by Plato. I read it also. It was, eh, it's okay. Not super interesting. And Bacon, if you remember, he was the guy who lived at the same time as Shakespeare. And a lot of people claim that he actually wrote some or all of Shakespeare's works. I don't know if I buy that, but <laughs> he was definitely a, a smart guy. Now, besides that, uh, there were other people who said the story was true. And some said it was literally true. Included in that school was the Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher, a German priest. In 1664, he wrote a book called Mundus Subterraneus, in which he suggested that the tithes were not caused by the sun and moon, like uh, what that Newton guy was talking about. <laughs> no, no, no. They were caused by water moving to and from a subterranean ocean. And he wrote a book about that, and there was a map of Atlantis in it where he mentions Plato as a source. And, you know, this theory just would not die. People found it fascinating. The Victorians, of course, revived it. It was actually an American, though, that really got it going again. Ignatius Donnelly, he was from Minnesota. He was a politician. He was in the Minnesota State House and Congress and so on. And he was a science writer. And he rekindled the topic with the book Atlantis and the Antediluvian World, 1882. Now, I have also read this book, and it is it is interesting. I would recommend it. It's a fun read. It's got all the speculation about how the Atlanteans, they founded the uh, Mayan culture and the Egyptian culture. And, you know, yeah, it was about where Plato said it was, except, you know, right out in the middle of the Atlantic, because, you know, Plato didn't know it extended as far as it does. So, of course, once you know a little bit more, it's a lot like Eric von Donegan's book, Chariots of the Gods. I mean, it's pseudoscience. It's got some interesting, convincing theories until you know a little bit more and you know the more plausible explanations for these things. Still, it's a, it's a fun read. Now, Atlantis just plays into a lot of things. Uh, Madame Helena Blavatsky founded a cult called the Theosophical Society. S -S Society. Uh, she said that it was Atlantis was one of the origins of our culture, that they were the giants that built Stonehenge, and they, they went to Egypt and Mexico and founded those cultures. That's kind of reminiscent of the same thing Donnelly said. Uh, then uh, there's the Antarctica theory. A couple different writers wrote about that. In 1958, a guy named Charles Hapgood published a book called The Earth Shifting Crust. Uh, with a foreword by Albert Einstein, of all people. Now, he said that the continental drift, you know, the plate tectonics, that shifted Atlantis all the way down to the South Pole where it froze over. Well, we know that plate tectonics are probably, you know, a real thing, but, but it doesn't happen, like, overnight. It takes hundreds of millions of years. So that theory is, although entertaining, it's kind of silly. Another writer, Flavio Barbieri, wrote about this in 1974, about Antarctica being the site of Atlantis. 
Uh, but the more convincing theory, the more um, the more plausible theory is that it was based Atlantis was based on the island of Crete when the Minoan civilization, one of the most advanced civilizations in the ancient world, they had writing when a time when most Europeans were barbarians and they had great buildings and public works and uh, advanced society and that at the time there was this island of Santorini where there was this volcano called Thera, it erupted, all this ash, destruction, tidal waves, and this destroyed the Minoan civilization. So that's what Atlantis represents now. Uh, it actually was probably more complicated now. Scholars believe that there was more than just that. There were famines, you know, there was climate cycles, there were uh, in, very invaders, barbarian invaders coming in from the sea. Uh, they're still kind of mysterious, but there's all sorts of, there's great videos on that, on YouTube, etc., on the sea peoples. Uh, and I recommend those, it's, it's a fascinating topic. And the Minoans too were very wonderful. They had supposedly though the Minotaur, <laughs> the half man, half bull monster is one of the legends that comes from that, from King Minos. Uh, more recently, we've had other theories similar to that one, but they place Atlantis in other places like, oh, the Bermuda Triangle, or off the coast of Cuba, or, you know, in uh, Bahamas. But the craziest one I heard, and this was by YouTube channel, was it Bright Insight? My apologies if it wasn't, because <laughs> this is kind of kooky. Uh, it was in the Sahara Desert. And uh, there was these rings, concentric rings of land or, or sediment or, or rock or whatever that kind of look like the uh, description of Atlantis in Plato. Now, to me, I thought, I thought more like it was an asteroid impact, maybe. <laughs> like, who knows what that could be? But Atlantis, I kind of doubt it. Fiction, though. Fiction, you know, we can dispense with most of the nonfiction, but fiction is pretty great because we've had all this fantastic uh, tales and stories about Atlantis that it has inspired. Uh, it started a great treasure trove in the Victorian era with the scientific romances, and there was a lot of overlap with the fact and fiction. Uh, some would present it as fact. Uh, one of the First, one of my favorites is Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues into the Sea, 1869, in which uh, Captain Nemo and his crew, they visit the sunken ruins of Atlantis aboard Nautilus. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, this was 1913, so that's not much past the Victorian era. Tarzan series, the lost city of Opar was a colony of Atlantis. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes guy. He wrote a novel called America Deep, which describes the discovery of the sunken ruins of Atlantis by a deep sea expedition. And this was way in 1929. So kind of near the end of his career, but he actually wrote a lot of good sci-fi, even as dated as it is, I would say, check it out. That's not just Sherlock Holmes, Robert E. Howard. He was the creator of Conan, Tragically short life, only lived 30 years. Imagine if he had, you know, lived to be 80 or something like that. And he had the character Cole from Atlantis. He also said that Conan, the Cimmerian, that's Sim, not Sumerian, that the Cimmerians were descended from the Atlanteans. In sci-fi's golden age, we had a mention of Atlantis. We had Robert A. Heinlein's Lost Legacy, 1941. Uh, about Atlantis. Uh, we had C.S. Lewis mentioning it in The Magician's Nephew, kind of part of the Narnia series where they use uh, magic dust uh, from Atlantis to get to Narnia. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, Cimmerillion. And he wasn't writing about Atlantis per se, but he based his island of Numenor pretty much on the Atlantis legend. It's, the description is really very similar. And this was published posthumously in 77, but he was writing this stuff starting in 1914. Paul Anderson had one in 1971, The Dancer of Atlantis, where he's talking about the, the Crete Minoan theory. And I can't, I can't go without mentioning 
uh, Robert Shea and Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus Trilogy, <laughs> 1975, in which the hero Hagbard Selene and his crew travel to submerged Atlantis. And in this book, the island Fernando Po, which is a real island off the coast of Africa, it's the last fragment of the remains of Atlantis. The story also says that the Illuminati, the famed notorious Illuminati, originated in Atlantis. I once met a guy whose last name was Illuminati. How cool is that? <laughs> I was jealous. Let's see, Larry, Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell has mentioned it in some of their fantasy stuff. There's a couple good uh, YA series, K. Applegate's Animorphs series, Ian Koifer's Artemis Fowl, the teenage master criminal. These two mention Atlantis. Harry Turtledove has have a trilogy about Atlantis in which it's actually the east coast of the U.S. which broke off from North America, so it's its own island country. Haven't read it? I highly recommend his stuff. It's very good. So you would think, you would think with all these great ideas that there would be tons and tons and loads of steampunk involving Atlantis. Well, you'd be wrong. There's not that much. <laughs> and I may be misremembering. I may have not seen them yet, but I really can't think of very much. And if you guys out there can inform me, please let me know of anything I missed. Now, the best one, the most obvious one, is a Disney animation called Atlantis, The Lost Empire, 2001, before their unfortunate woke era, <laughs> in which a young linguist named Milo Thatch uh, gets, this po gets possession of a sacred book, and he finds directions to Atlantis. So he hires this mercenary crew to go down and find it. And it's got a great voice cast, including Michael J. Fox, James Garner, Leonard Nimoy, uh, Claudia Christian, uh, David Ogden Stiers, and Jim Varney, who was Ernest. This was his last film role. Very sad. Anyhow, the one classical steampunk thing I came up with was a series I have read called The Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences by Pip Valentine and T. Morris, one of my absolute favorites. In this series, Atlantis is the source of some of this wild and crazy advanced technology that the agents Eliza Braun and Wellington Books use in their endeavors. So, so much for the steampunk. Again, I can't think of much. Let me know if you can. So, to recap, Atlantis, great story. Is it totally allegory? Is it based on fact? We don't know. Uh, lots of speculation. I'm sure it will continue. I'm sure it will also continue to inspire fiction and ripping yarns and exciting stories. This has been my video on Atlantis, the Lost Continent. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Please like and subscribe. Please also check out my works on Amazon. I am getting closer now that I was able to get some editing done <laughs> for a while. Getting closer to putting some more out there on the platform. So, for now, the Steampunk Desperado is saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.